Okay, let's have a look at the Hexa Orland approach. You can see here two uh, pictures of Eli Hexer and Bertel Olin. So you can see here that we are now in the 20th century. And therefore, you can expect that something will be more important to com compare to the Ricardo world. And uh, of course, it is the role of capital. So we are in the 20th century. And therefore, capital has a much more important role compared to the Ricardo world. And we directly see uh, this difference in the assumptions of the model. We are looking at two countries, Germany and China, two goods, steel and cloth. And now we are looking at two factors of production, labor and capital. We assume that the steel sector is a capital intensive sector, while the cloth sector is a labor intensive sector. So when we are producing steel, we need a lot of capital, not too much labor. When we are producing cloth, we need a lot of labor, not too much capital. The production functions in the two countries are the same. So the technology within the two countries is the same. This is very interesting. So we assume that the two countries have the same stand of knowledge. So this is because of the fact that now information can flow between these two economies and um, we just have to visit international libraries and then we know the current stand of knowledge so that production functions are the same in the two countries. This can also be justified, for example, when we think about Foreign Direct Investment, FDI. Let's assume that VW, Volkswagen, that they have one plant in Germany and they also have one plant in China. Of course, the knowledge how to produce cars is within the company. And therefore, we can produce um, cars in Germany and in China with the same production function. Technology is the same. The stand of knowledge is the same. What is the big difference between the countries? The big difference between Germany and China is that relative factor endowments are different. The domestic economy, Germany, is the capital abundant country. It has a lot of capital, not too much labor. And the foreign country, China, is a labor abundant country. It has a lot of labor and not too much capital. So the capital labor ratio in Germany is larger than the capital labor ratio in China. Germany is the capital abundant country. Therefore, in the autarky scenario, it will be the case that the price of the capital intensive good, steel, will be relatively low. China is a labor abundant country. So the price of the labor-intensive good cloth will be relatively low in the autarky scenario. When it comes to international trade, then it will be the case that Germany will specialize in steel when, and will export steel because of the fact that steel is uh, relatively cheap in Germany. And China will specialize in cloth and will export cloth because cloth is relatively cheap in China. This kind of pattern of international trade is condensed in the so-called heckscher olin theory. A country will export the commodity that uses relatively intensively its relatively abundant factor of production and it will import the good that uses relative intensively its relatively scarce factor of production. 
What does this Hector Orlin theorem implies for our example? Germany is the country which is capital abundant and steel is using capital relative intensively. So Germany will export the commodity that uses relative intensively its relatively abundant factor of production. So Germany will export steel and will import the good yet uses relative intensively its relatively scarce factor of production. Scarce factor of production in Germany is labor. The good which uses relatively intensively this scarce factor of production, this is cloth. So Germany will import cloth. So in the first step, we examined what are the consequences of these differences in relatively factor endowment for the pattern of international trade. Hence, we know which country is specializing in which sector and which country is exporting which good, which country is importing the other good. But this pattern of international trade has an impact on the two factor prices. So there will be some consequences for the interest rate, the price of capital, and there will also be some consequences for the wage rate, the price of labor. Let's have a deeper look into these factor markets and check how this pattern of international trade affect the factor markets. In Germany, it is the case that the steel sector expands and the cloth sector shrinks. So some resources like capital and labor are shifted from the cloth sector to the steel sector. The cloth sector is shrinking, the steel sector is expanding. But the bundle of resources which is released from the cloth sector is different from the bundle which is desired in the steel sector because the factor intensities in the two sectors are different. The cloth, the cloth sector is releasing a bundle of factors of production which contain a lot of labor and not too much capital units. So the cloth sector is releasing a lot of labor units but not too much capital. But the steel sector, which is expanding, needs a lot of capital, but not too much labor. So we have a mismatch on the two factor markets so that factor prices will be affected. We have a higher demand for capital and we have a lower demand for labor. The consequences for the wage rate and the interest rates are highlighted on the next slide. You can see here in the left part the capital market, uh, the price, the interest rate for capital on the left vertical axis, on the horizontal axis the number of capital units. On the labor market we have on the vertical axis the wage rate and on the horizontal axis the labor units traded. There is a downward sloping demand curve and we assume that supply is given. Now we said due to the fact that the cloth sector shrinks and does not release too much capital and the steel sector expands and needs a lot of capital, we have an increase for capital. So the demand curve in the German capital markets will shift to the right and therefore the interest rate increases. On the German labor market, it is the other way around. The cloth sector is releasing a lot of, cap a lot of labor 
but the expanding steel sector doesn't need this number of labor units. So we have a mismatch on the labor market. The demand for labor decreases so that the demand curve shifts to the left. The demand curve shifts to the left and the wage rate decreases. As you can see here in this graph, the two factor markets are affected in a different way. Demand for capital increases and the interest rate increases, while on the labor market, it is the case that demand for labor decreases and the wage rate decreases. These kind of movements of the two factor prices are condensed in the so-called Stolper-Samuelson theorem. The increase in the price of the abundant factor in Germany, the interest rate increases, and the fall in the price of the scarce factor, the wage rate decreases, imply that the owners of the abundant factor capital will find their real incomes rising and the owners of the scarce factor labor will find their real incomes falling. So the owners of the relatively abundant factor, they are in favor of international trade. They are free traders. The owners of the relatively scarce factor, they are in favor of trade restrictions. So in Germany, it would imply that labor unions are more against international trade because of the fact that international trade would lead to a decrease in the wage rate. They would favor trade restrictions. Okay, when it comes to the heckscher olin theory, it is a case that it seems to be the case that we have some winners and some losers of the globalization process. Those households who own capital They benefit from international trade because the interest rate increases. They get more compensated for this capital units. And the households which can only provide labor at the labor market, they observe that the wage rate is decreasing so that their income decreases. So now it really depends how capital and labor is distributed within our society. In case that we assume that we are have a re representative agent in our economy, that all the households in our economy are the, the same, so that each household has some income from the capital market because each household owns some stocks and bonds and receives income in form of dividend and interest, then everything is fine. Like all the households profit from the increase in the interest rate and all households suffer a little bit from uh, the decrease in the wage rate. When we really look into detail, it would be the case that we are able to prove that a representative agent will win from the globalization process, that the increase in the interest rate overcompensates for the loss on the wage rate. But when we abolish the assumption of the representative agent, then of course, it might be the case that one group of society is winning while another group of the society is losing. In case that we have some households which have no capital at all, and those households can only provide labor at the labor market, they will be against international trade because of the fact that they only receive wage income and wages are decreasing from this globalization process. So it really depends on how capital 
and labor are distributed within our society. It might be the case that we have a group which is losing from the globalization process. This is the, the main insight, I think, from the heckscher olin model. It might be the case that some groups within one society will lose from international trade. 